Hi, everybody. Our last episode, we talked about uh, chat, uh, chat GPT, but also TikTok being banned on campuses. So we wanted to get some more insights uh, from an expert on how this could impact universities and students. Welcome back to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. My guest today is Vince Kellen. He's the CIO at UC San Diego. He, he's right on the front lines of the, the college campus stuff. Vince, how you doing? Great. I'm doing great, Keith. So, uh, you know, are you guys following this whole TikTok bans that, um, because, you know, there's a lot of states that have started to ban TikTok. I know in California that they haven't yet banned it, but it, there is a bill uh, potentially discussing it. What, 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 what are they saying on campus around this idea? Well, in our neck of the woods here in UC, not a lot, actually, because, um, you know, I, I kind of look at it as really you're worried about what TikTok is doing, but not worried about Google and Amazon are doing. Right. You know, and so I think there's a bit of uh, sort of gang tackling going on on this. And it's a bit of a politicized uh, discussion now more than a real one. Yeah, there's privacy concerns about TikTok, but my goodness gracious, there's privacy concerns about freaking everything out here now. All right, so so you guys can separate it then from from more of uh, it's it's the like you know the China side of things and the privacy issues there versus you know just general social media. You sort of just kind of lump in TikTok with general social media uh, concerns then. Yeah, there is, and clearly we know that China is a nation state, and they're you know it's China Inc. so to speak, and it's a uh, and and there's a sort of a geopolitical and even military agenda behind some of this, um, and you know for TikTok to be viable sooner or later, that's going to have to be addressed by China at some point, um, but in the here and now, and the way the students use it, and the way we look at it, okay, so China gets personalized information on our students, like Google does, like. Actually, Facebook MetaPixel product right. has been doing right, um, and so now, how do I rank that threat? Right, and right now, it's not as high of a ranking threat as some other threats that I've got. It's a different matter for for people in either military or government who are absolutely targeted by China to be uh, to have to be very careful if they're going to be using TikTok. Right. Uh, and so I can see that, but for the general student population, I mean, telling them not to use TikTok, I mean, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, even 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 some of these bands that are coming out, there are ways around it because uh, all the all of the universities that are doing it are just banning Wi-Fi access uh, so that you can't That's use it. it on a campus network. Uh, but yeah, you know, you can still use it with a, with 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 a five G. Would you guys have yeah, to? Geofencing G- yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but if if the state if California did decide to ban it for for public um, devices would then the University of California system have to then sort of implement this as well? Or could they separate themselves from whatever state ban happens? As I'm reading it now, the mm-hmm. bans are more of government employees can't use it. Okay. On their government device. Right. And how is and it? So yeah. that'll, that'll be the nature of the ban. But for those of us who use personal devices, so what? Yeah. But but they, you wouldn't be able to access it on the technically the corporate Wi-Fi, right? Or the corporate or the campus Wi-Fi. Um, I doubt they'll get to that point <laughs> because we even haven't banned all sites in China, for example. Okay. Right? And okay. We, we know, understand in, in our world here, we are a, a hot target of cyber attacks from China. No question because of the nature of our research and our institution. Right. And so my security team is fighting uh, China on a day-to-day basis. Um, and so I'm not seeing that there would be a ban that we would really have to do that on. And by the way, there's going to be all sorts of freedom of speech stuff this year. I'm assuming on some of this stuff. Yeah. Now there was an article that I, I did see about, uh, concerns around TikTok from the social media aspect of it, where the increase of use of TikTok could lead to eating disorders and, uh, potential suicide, uh, increase things like that. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that you would also then sort of kind of categorize this with other social media tools out there and, and other apps that do the same thing. Yeah. 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 TikTok's not the first thing to do that. In fact, one can argue the rise of gaming in the 90s started all of this uh, and the personal computing revolution, so to speak. So our view of it is we're an educational institution. So we educate our students on how to properly use things and master things. Okay. Uh, it's not our 
place to take away that which you know they can easily get through other means right so with the university kind of uh, approach and there's always that academic freedom things it always feels like there's more it's more open than maybe at a at a, yes. at a business correct absolutely yeah and it, and it has to be because the think about it from a learner's perspective if i'm going to be trying to learn a topic i'm going to be searching and doing things and, and using the internet like crazy to help me and it, you know, trying to put a lid on that uh, is is impossible. Okay, but does does do you still? So does that mean you take a hands off approach completely, or do you still have to say like you because you still have to protect your servers and and students' research, right? If if you're saying that like yeah, so there is still a security aspect that you have to be aware of there and is, tell students, but, right? But banning a thing is not the security technique to use. It's okay. the worst. The best technique is to put the proper security controls in place on your software, on your networks, and, and handle the intrusion there. Um, if we're concerned about cyber attacks and cyber hacking, that's one thing. If we're concerned about information people absorb and use on their in their heads, that's a whole other thing that right. we don't get involved with. Okay. But the hacking aspect, absolutely. But there's things, there's ways of doing that uh, within our network that don't restrict uh, flow of information. That's that's appropriate. Okay. Uh, so let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about um, uh, Chat GPT because I think that's another big thing that that students and educational institutions are, are are worried are starting to get worried about. I know in the New York City public schools, for example, they they've placed a ban on on students using that, and universities and individual professors, I think, have, have their own opinions about it. Um, what are your thoughts about about you know this whole tool that is that has been taking the internet by storm? Yeah, I, I, I'm actually giving a talk here in San Diego uh, at a conference in early April. I'm calling it Chat GPT colon Terror and Promise in Higher Education. Um, you the, talk, talk about the terror first, and then we'll get into the, yeah, the, the, the promise. You know, uh, the parents' response is, oh, my God, they're going to use this to cheat in class? Ah! Yeah. Right? And, and so the older adult perspective is that it's like, oh my gosh, they can cheat and cheat. And I'm like, okay, who's, how is the teacher designing the class that makes it easy for them to cheat? Well, essay paper, you know, now there's a way you can write essay papers that can even get cause chat GP to, to not do well. Mm -hmm. So what it means, it's kind of an arms race between pedagogy and technology. Right. And bad pedagogy will lose this arms race. So you have to have good pedagogy. So we've got some faculty members here who are talking about, hey, I think I'm going to do an assignment where I'm going to tell the student, use chat GPT to write an essay and then critique it. Okay. Yeah, that's a, right? that, that's a cool idea. You know, or comparing and contrasting or prove to me where and chat GPT will confabulate because it's just an associated predictive model. So it will confabulate and tell me where uh, chat GPT is confabulating here. Do you have uh, to chat do, GPT? Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. ChatGPT is limited in, in the content it has at a point in time right now, which means new content won't be there. And it will always have this sort of stability issue uh, in terms of what data it can get at. Do you get to handle all of the kind of comments or uh, I don't want to say complaints, but like what, you know, or feedback from these parents that are that are or does it does it go more to the professors or the individual kind of teachers at, at the university? Um, we don't necessarily get a whole lot of parent feedback yeah. because the parents are dropping the kids off at the, the traditional <laughs> college age student and, and the kids are happy not to have the parents there. But for the instructors, yes, there are some instructors who are legitimately worried that this could be used to, you know, cheat on answers. And so there's plagiarism software out there that's adding chat GPT checks into the plagiarism software. That right. will that will continue. But I think at the end of the day, the terror of uh, Chet GPT will cause continued pedagogical reform, which is needed in higher education. We need better pedagogy. Right. Now, is that is that sort of the promise? Like you say, we're like the, the, the terror plus then the, the promise or the, the good side of, yeah. of Chet GPT. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Is it just that it improves the, the way that um, teachers teach or is it or can students use the tool to help them learn better? You know, um, one of our faculty did a focus group with students, and a student made a comment that really struck with me. The student said, you know, chat GPT is like a calculator for writing. Okay, yeah. They used to, you, know, they, you used to calculate to do math rather than do it longhand by hand. And they said, chat GPT is that. 
And actually one of my direct reports is using ChatGPT to write UC San Diego job descriptions. So it saves me an hour of writing time. <laughs> and it gets to a good point where then I just edit the easier part. Right, right. And, and so I think the students are actually have their eye on what this thing really is better probably than some of the adults in the room. Right, right. Every time I, I bring up chat GPT with someone, someone comes up with a, even a, a better idea that I haven't thought of yet. So I... I tell people just let's just keep coming up with ideas and see what happens and see what happens rather than trying to always focus on the bad. But I do have one that's that terrorizes me and, and scares me and it, and it probably scares you as well Is there was a, an article we saw on CSO, one of our sister publications about um, hackers from Eastern Europe are now asking chat GPT to write better spam or phishing emails mm-hmm. because it always felt like the, 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 the last line of defense when I would get an email was like, oh, this is horribly written. It could have no way been written by, you know, our CIO or or the, someone yeah. that was asking me for money for my company. But now if you can sort of correct that, then all of a sudden now I have to train myself to really look at some of these emails that are coming across, right? Well, yeah, I, yes, I, I, absolutely. Although, you know, again, the, the more an email that comes in, looks like a real email, the more obviously it's going to get through any filters. So then the question becomes for the reader of the email, am I expecting this email? Right. And and so I've been moving for years because I've been doing this since the birth of the internet. Um, You know, the most powerful key on my keyboard is the delete key. (laughs) And so I just delete away, right? And if I'm not expecting an email from somebody, bam, it goes. Email is a corrupt email. uh, communication vehicle and the young generation knows it. So they don't communicate in email. So what are they, what have they replaced it with just texting? Uh, texting and, uh, you know, some of these, um, uh, you know, like the signals and some of the secure texting things, so they'll use that. Yep. Uh, uh, so some of the social media platforms, absolutely. Um, but they don't really communicate in email. And so now they'll, when they wor- enter the working world, they'll start to realize that email is a business communication tool and they'll start to see that. But I think they're gonna get pretty savvy pretty quick by trying to figure it out. Am I expecting this from somebody and, and not doing it? That said, it's a cat and mouse game when we when we see these things. Uh, we, you know, we're constantly monitoring a network, so we see it. So then we might say, okay, hey, we're seeing a pattern of traffic here. Let's start, let's start doing, um, preventative measures so that people don't click on that link or if they do they get routed to something internally that that tells them you you know this is an unsafe link right but it is a cat and mouse game um but again the phishing attempt is just step one of a multi-step approach and so we call it i call it prevent the pivot it's like in basketball i gotta prevent the guy from pivoting around me Uh uh-huh uh, so the attacker comes in, gets a credential, gets a hold of one device, and that leads to other devices. So this zero trust concept of how to prevent the pivot right. now weighs in. And so we're trying to prevent the pivot as well. Okay, <laughs> right. And, and you know, you mentioned uh, savvy students, and, and so that leads me sort of to my broader question. It's been a while since I've been in college. In fact, the last time I so – when I was in college, they didn't even have laptops or PDAs or – PDAs. Oh my God. I'm never really now showing you how old I am. Yeah, really? Uh, they didn't have laptops, smartphones, etc. In order to get any sort of computer work done, you had to go to a lab with a room. And um, even, yeah. even in my journalism classes, they just, they had just gotten a computer lab with a couple of Macs that started teaching computer uh, uh, print yeah. design, you know, uh, desktop publishing, things like that. So how, uh, how long so how long have you been in the university community and, and have you seen waves of students that are more and more tech savvy as they enter? Yes. Yeah. And before I answer that, I do okay. want to end with one last thing on chat GPT. Okay, sure. The one thing that scares me more than anything is who owns chat GP today. Right. And what will they do with it? Okay. Because we now have a new class of actors in the geopolitical stage called billionaires. Uh-huh who will buy entire large companies in order to achieve geopolitical aims. Now that's a legitimate concern, just like China owning TikTok. Okay. And so the difference is uh, in American sponsored billionaire land, there'll be less control over it. 
Uh, so we'll pivot all our efforts to banning TikTok while overlooking uh, perhaps what might be inappropriate uses. Right. The, the, the biggest the, the, there was a story about how Microsoft wants to invest 10, 10 billion dollars, I think, into, oh gosh, yeah. into open a. So that concerns you, <laughs> I would say. Um, well, or, because think about it. Right. So that the chicken's going to come come home to risk. They're yeah. going to need to make money off of that. So where are they going to make the money? Right. And so this will be a ration good. Right. Right. I doubt it. It might be turned loose on the Internet writ large. But, you know, think about it. Generating text isn't necessarily it was well, threatening to Google. It's not like vitally threatening, threatening just yet. Right. But because actually, that I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, doesn't work. wouldn't a com- wouldn't a better Bing, for example, be good for Internet users so that you wouldn't have to necessarily rely on Google for everything? You could actually make a choice. Well, yeah, and Google will probably add that into their own platform. This is not, right. it's not necessarily horribly, de- that what's the hard part of this is the scale of compute and the content. The content is owned by the internet writ large over, so everybody has access to that. Not yeah. everybody has access to the compute, but the actual algorithms are, you know, anybody can reproduce this. So in time, Google will do it. I think the shining example of where ChatGPT will work will be inside the enterprise to answer questions like, oh, I'm a UC San Diego employee. How do I access the network via VPN? Right. That's what it'll be. That's where it's going to shine. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. Because obviously, Uh, you know, just to go back to what what, what the conversational AI that people were having before, it was always, you know, Amazon Alexa and some of the voice recognition stuff. And it was awful. I mean, I still yell at my Alexa on a regular basis because, well, first, the device always clicks on at the wrong time because we changed the language to Echo. And somehow, if I say Gecko, it clicks on or something that's close yeah, yeah. to yeah so it's usually listening whenever i don't even need to and then when i'm asking it a question some it like totally gets the questions wrong so i wouldn't yeah. mind if even even if you know the chat gpt sort of conversational ai I could get put into this chat bot from amazon so that i could actually get answers and helpful but i i don't see that because i also see amazon trying to just make money off of it as well like well they, i yeah. actually think the shape of the problem is slightly different okay and chat gpt would have to be altered yeah to be more concise precise and simple now by the way the same technique chat gpt is doing is available to amazon and everybody now right and so my prediction is Everybody will be putting in these predictive language models in their platforms yeah. and adjusting them to their aim. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the platform on the internet writ large is going to be an interesting uh, jungle fight. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see where that goes. Yeah. I, and I mean, does, does that mean that, that then if Microsoft puts that much money into it, that I mean, enterprise, it's more, enterprise, or, enterprise. It's all going to be enterprise stuff. Yeah, I, I think I think a big chunk is if this is going to shine in the enterprise in a big way. One, our content is stable. Our content is cordon. Yeah, our content doesn't have the squawkiness, meaning bias and weirdness of general internet content. It's really boring stuff. Yeah, and ChatGPT is going to shine on that. Have you looked at Have you looked at some of the uh, artwork stuff? The you know sort of like yes. the, the the Dolly or the Wally or. And things like that. Yeah, Does, that's that's yeah, that's going to be a little more interesting and problematic. And what about the voice stuff? Have you like that voice stuff terrifies me too? Uh, in what way? Oh well, in terms of like if they, if you can, Microsoft put out something where it was like the you could take a three second audio clip, and then it could it could use voice recognition and then create voice synthesis to say anything else that yeah. sounds like you. So, yeah, you know, the, voice yeah, biometrics the, and, you know, yeah. deep faking yeah, and things act- like that. And the Actors Guild is probably all over this. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the what's, what it's going to cause, think about it, think about it, right? So, when you get verisimilitude, meaning um, you get this level that's a, that's a college of, word Vince <laughs> yeah well it's a level of belief in the what you're looking at that yeah. it's very real right it causes us to move where we place our trust right and so human trust which I call all this digitization of trust is a very interesting puzzle because I would like to tell people, would you pick your next next spouse based on their blockchain certificate? Probably <laughs> not, right? And so if I see these images and voices that are completely fake, it will cause humans to adjust where they place their trust. 
and they will place their trust not in that thing unless that thing is completely trustworthy. Right. Right. So humans are slippery little animals, right? So we change or we place our trust based upon what's around us. So I think, uh, you know, it's problematic because who you are and who's representing you becomes kind of, you know, hard to control. But on the other hand, trustful delivery of that is more interesting. So I think the NFT side of this is kind of interesting because it's a way of trying to establish trust right, over that. Stuff. Right. And trust is so hard to find in, in real life with real humans these days, too. It, it, well, yeah. it, it has. And I, don't think, I don't think trust between humans has changed a jot in, in 10,000 years. I think it's about the same <laughs> as it always was, especially if you read ancient Roman history. Oh, I did notice uh, that, that you like that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you know I read the letters of Cicero. Uh, my God, you know the politicians today were pretty sad compared to Cicero. He was pretty, <laughs> pretty brutal, pretty clever. So our, our politicians have not improved much the state of the art of politics. Yes, they just they don't carry their spears, you know, in, in public. It's all <laughs> it's behind, not as refined. It's not yeah. as intricate. It's not as complicated. I would say it's more brutish. All right, let's let's jump at we'll, uh, we'll yeah, let's yeah. just let's just jump back to that other question about the tech savviness of, yeah, yeah. of today's today's students versus when you were, you and I went to college. Uh, fascinating. Um, I've often said technology is the most interesting technology invented by humans because it is taught <laughs> child to parent not parent to child. Yeah. And that's really interesting. Um, on the other side, I'm also shocked with how much students learn just through this device. Really? You know, I mean, they're, they, well, yeah, they're yeah. doing everything on the device. E-commerce is now done on the phone. It's not even done on a screen on the web anymore. So the younger generations, and I remind people, you know, every four to five years, uh, the generation shift mm -hmm. in their technology sort of affinities a bit. And so sometimes seniors look at freshmen and go, that's kind of weird. You play with technology that way. And so we look at it as adults going, that's weird. Well, um, if, even in a four to five year span, the kids are thinking that's kind of weird. So there's an evolution of use by the students. Right. I think where it's headed and where it's at, where it's going to stay for quite a long time is this anything everywhere concept. Uh, at any time, meaning I can do it now, here, then, right? So uh, information at the speed of thought. People call it ADD. That may be true. I'm constantly being d diverted into other things. Yep. But I also look at it as doing things at the speed of thought, like, oh, I want to fulfill a need, so therefore I can look it up here. Yep. It's hard to play any board game Scrabble today without people doing the word check on their phone at the same time. Right, right. right. And so the information foraging that goes on now is instant, constant all the time. That may be good too as well. Yeah, does, does that put pressure on you in terms of supporting yes. the technology at the university? Yes, because we've noticed a shift since COVID. Students are parking their, their butt in a chair with a laptop kind of anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're showing up in places we didn't think they would show up anymore. Right, so so, it's, so a know, traditional sort of network scan or, or you know making sure that you have connectivity in different areas that's yes. probably out the window now, or do you just have to like double and triple your capacity? No, I've had to increase our Wi-Fi coverage, no yeah. question, uh, in all sorts of places. Uh, and that's going to continue. I'm starting to realize when you take away people's Wi-Fi, it's like shooting their dog. <laughs> it, it is like, you know, I, I could offend their mother. They wouldn't be so concerned. So but, you, you, could, you, could, uh, you could, you don't have to ban TikTok. You could just sort of shut down the Wi-Fi and then, and then, call up Verizon oh, or T-Mobile. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In you, fact, we had a, we had a protest on campus because of Wi-Fi degradation one year. Oh, okay. So I'm going to bring this up, Vince. My So my uh, niece goes to the school there. So my niece is a freshman at UCSD. And so I texted uh -huh. my brother and said that I was going to be talking to you on, on the show. And the first thing he sends back to me is a text message from his daughter saying, hey, can you ask him to improve the Wi-Fi at, at uh, uh, your dome, M-U-I-R? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, put that on the list of, of yeah, improving yeah. the Wi-Fi. Well, and, and actually, that's a really good question because here's what's happening uh, with all of our technologies. Um, the spectrums are competing with each other in Bluetooth tends to squash a lot of things so when we walk through dorm rooms we see all sorts of bluetooth speakers bluetooth whatever uh, we see rogue uh, wireless access points we see microwaves right 
and students and then we see laptops that are actually misconfigured that they bought uh, right. from whatever and they're they're they're, they're using the 24 versus a 5 uh, gigahertz channel for this and so it ends up being a 3 hour sort of scan the environment and replace things in the room yeah uh, problem. Now, there's other issues, too, with buildings and walls. I like to say that once we release photons into the air, we're out of control. <laughs> God's in control. Right. And um, and but we do routinely go through and respond to those requests and say, hey, if it looks like we have a little problem spot in a particular door, let's see what we can do to either tweak or, or deal with the signal. In some cases, the signal try to adjust themselves. But in general, um, buildings, walls and interfering signals wreak havoc yeah yeah and that's not going away either right it's not like you can just no. say you can't wire a building at this point that's just that just doesn't seem no, to make any financial no. sense i mean and we do wire buildings but no even if it does make financial sense it does, it's not the way people work people yeah want the wireless right so so that's the biggest the biggest change since the return from COVID is that, that now that students are just working wherever the heck they want and just using yes. every device that they want things like that. Yes. Now, yeah. you know, I, I did read something else that you had done in terms of like sort of software applications to really help students get around. Uh, you know, you mentioned that um, students, you know, have a need and then they immediately go to their phone. Does that mean you have to have a mobile presence to answer their questions and things like that? And that, that takes a lot of software development time, right? Yes, it does. And yeah. it's an evolution because you can't do it all forever. But uh, obviously, things like um, occupancy, parking occupancy, lab occupancy, et cetera, those have been some of the first things out there. General lookup for information. Um, but as year over year goes by, we're going to continue to grow and expand that. Um, and uh, so to me, I call it an evolution that never ends. Uh, you're just going to keep adding more to the mobile experience over and over and over. Right, right. And you guys are using some analytics as well to, to help help the students. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or is, uh, yeah, or we've is got a lot of projects. Yeah, we, uh, well, we've got all sorts of interesting analytical capabilities, um, and uh, some of it is dedicated to you know how to, looking at our degree programs and our courses and where the bottlenecks, how are students not getting through, what can we do to improve all of that. Uh, we certainly have analysis of the uses of our LMS. So we know, you know, our students coming in the LMS, are they using it? Mm -hmm. uh, how's the pattern of use changing over time? Uh, we've got advising tools where students can do it virtually, uh, you know, asynchronously or synchronously with an advisor. It's called our virtual advising center. Uh, that's quite popular. Uh, so we've got a bunch of analytics that help us figure out how to improve certain things. Right. Um, we haven't necessarily done a whole lot of helping students help them, you know, with reminders or prediction. We certainly have predictions of how well we think students are going to graduate on time. And that helps guide our advising activities. Right, so, right. Uh, and that's based on predictors of, of things that tell us which students are likely to straggle here as they get out. Um, but in terms of individual affordances, that's really up to our advising pool, mm -hmm. our advisors, and then, of course, our faculty and, of course, the students themselves. Students are quite inventive in working with each other and web services out in the Internet to figure things out. Um, so to me, it's, it's one big soup. It's a complex soup. You know, yeah, yeah. So uh, with with the, the students that are tech savvy, do you tend to see new technologies and some of these emerging technologies sooner than maybe the general public does? Uh, you know, are, is there yes. interest on uh, with VR and AR that we're hearing about those types of, yes. of things? So, you those know, those things will, yeah, those things do pop up. Yep. Uh, gaming pops up and, and throws up, throws, throws it in there. The need for virtual wayfinding or virtual onboarding is, has risen for us. Um, and, uh, and of course, students uh, with their tech uh, and say, you know, hey, you guys should be looking at this type of Wi-Fi, outdoor Wi-Fi tools. So we got a lot of students who like, you know, read up on this. And yeah. Like, hey, you want to work for us? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting pretty good here. They're like, no, I'm going uh, to I'm going to form a company and make a billion dollars and be one of those well, billionaires. Actually, one of that ha we have a yeah. student. We're doing work with their company, OccuSpace. They do sensor data that tells us how how occupied a building is. That's a student startup. Wow, that's cool. And and he's kind of reaching critical breakaway point as a startup. So absolutely, that happens quite a bit. 
All right. So if I'm not, so I shouldn't, so I shouldn't necessarily be worried about the TikTok ban, but what, you know, in terms of campus uh, technology use, is there anything that, that the rest of us should be concerned about or is it just yeah, more? I think, yeah. Go ahead. I, I think, um, you know, the privacy discussion on this is still acute everywhere and kind of as it should be. Um, and I think students are far more nuanced and capable than we often as adults give them credit for. But on the other hand, they don't have much to lose at this point in their life. Uh -huh. As you get older and you start to either accumulate assets or positions or roles where things can go south quickly in the internet, you get more concerned about the privacy. Yeah. So how, in, how to build this, this literacy around data uh, personally and reasoning about it is important. So that's concerning to me. There's another element to this that I think our student population will learn in time. And, and I'm about to write about it a little bit here. I'm calling it emotional intelligence around data. Mm -hmm. A lot of us say, oh, I have analytics, I have data that forms us. Really, but how do you truly make decisions as an individual? Well, you know, somebody yelled at me, so I did what they did. Well, that's anecdote by an important person who's making a decision, right? The nation just lived through the horrors of that in the last presidential run here. Right. Uh, and evidence-based decision-making is still very hard for humans to do individually. So as we get more information and more technology here, I'm starting to be more concerned about are we teaching uh, both adults and kids uh, the self-awareness skills in order to use these things well enough? And part of that self-awareness is understanding the importance of privacy and what that means to me, my family, and my friends. Right, right. All right. Vince, I could go on for another hour with, with, with questions for you, but uh, we are out of time. So uh, thanks again for uh, talking with us today on, on Today in Tech. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's all the time we've got for today's episode. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, just hit that like and subscribe button. Feel free to comment in the comment section below. And we will see you next time on Today in Tech. Thanks for watching.